So there's a space where the judgment and the perfection is intertwines with fear. <clears throat> Largely because the the perfection is the ideal standard for us that it says the judge is kind of determined if I do everything perfectly, I'll be safe. I'll avoid rejection, criticism, failure. And so the judge has kind of been an accountant and has all this book, book of laws, Miguel calls it, all these rules that we're supposed to follow to be perfect because if we're perfect, we can avoid the painful outcome that we're afraid of. That the victim's perspective, that the victim is particularly afraid of because the victim has a memory of here's in our past where we've been hurt, shamed, bullied, beaten up, abused. And so the memory has fear of that happening again. And perfection is the way to avoid it. And if those people, for ourselves, if we're perfect, and if those people in the world all behave properly and they all follow the rules, then everything will be orderly and everything will be predictable and the world will be safe and not enough to worry about getting hurt again. So this is where we've talked about perfection as a protective strategy. And all the judges' rules as a protective strategy that in the narrative story, is the solution, but in real life becomes this abusive tyrant. And it becomes the big abuser over us and our criticism of other people and anger towards other people, self-hate towards ourselves. This actually causes the very pains that it says it would be avoiding. So fear becomes a key component of this triangle, this suffering triangle. Fear principally being the perspective and experience and uh, of the victim. And the victim having two, two related components. One is the memory and, and the pain it's holding painful memory and two the fear of it happening again okay, so the victim has these two two roles and then the judge kind of anticipating the future and how we have to navigate it and be perfect to avoid this pain again and so fear acts as an alarm system one of the things, and we can just talk about different things that fear is. <clears throat> but fear acts as an alarm system, generally about the future or what might happen in an anticipatory way. Look out for that person, do this, don't do that. Oh, you better do this, you better not do that. What will they think? That's anticipating the future. But it's all based on what's happened to us in the past. What's been painful that we remember we're still attached to? What do we hold in memory, feel the pain of in memory that's stored there as emotion, that our mind is calculated, these are the rules we have to follow, this might happen again, look out for it. You know, if you ever touch a stove, you know, the next time you walk into the kitchen, you're looking at that stove like, oh, be careful. Shock my finger in a light bulb. It's like, okay, every light socket is like a little something in my nervous system looks at that situation and goes, oh. <laughs> I can be six feet away from it, but I feel it in my body, that memory of that pain or the shock. I, I'm not even close enough to touch it, but 
I see the queue, I see the stove, I see the light bulb socket, I see whatever it was. I think about it. I don't even have to be anywhere near something that was painful in the past. I just think about it. My body goes, shoot, that's what it felt like. And then judge and various characters start making strategies of rules about anticipating that oh, it could happen again. This is what we should do and shouldn't do. And this is what we should have done. He makes all these rules. Oddly, the rules it makes are made up to believe that they'll work. It's make believe rules. Just assume that, oh, I should have done this and that really would have worked. Okay. But not really it. Yeah, because different circumstance, different kind of person. Uh, talking to someone recently, and they they were dealing with this this settlement case, and they had hired an attorney, and they wanted an attorney to do something. But she's like, "I'm afraid. I, I I'm uncomfortable asking my attorney to go do this and ask this question." I'm like, "Okay, well, let's." And we. Kind of exploring like well, what is it what is it you're asking what was it you like what if we do this what if i get on the phone with you and i kind of help you you know talk you through it or you just know that i'm there some kind of support role and she's like oh no and boom her mind flashed back to being 12 in the principal's office and dad came in to you know kind of help straighten it out with the principal and it did not go well and she's like oh no And she could feel this discomfort with the asking this attorney to do something, which is somebody she's paying. The attorney works for her, but she was uncomfortable asking the attorney because it's like, oh, I feel like that 12 year old girl, this is a person in authority. I put them in that authority. And that was really uncomfortable because it went badly against me. And she realized that she was in the little girl perspective. The attorney was in a position of authority and power. And she didn't want to do anything to do with this person, even though she'd hired to help solve some, some problems. But as a 12 year old memory that was painful, this was a person in authority to be avoided. Therefore, don't ask these questions. Don't ask for help. And the thing that we're trying to solve with the attorney is actually not about the attorney at all. It's actually about what happened to us that's a painful memory that we are afraid of feeling again, that our mind has anticipated. This looks like that scenario. Be careful. Look out. And it's taking the fear of this painful memory happening again with the principal and parent, projecting it into today's adult world hiring an attorney and feeling like that will go that way again because the mind has taken some associations of here's, let me replay the emotional pain and fear warning out. And then the mind says, no, avoid that. Don't, don't call her, don't ask, don't call the attorney, don't ask for any of this thing. Which then creates this other pickle of like, well, I can't solve this problem I've got. So that's the fear alarm system part of it. Certainly there's more parts of those fears. That's one component and how it works into how we should be perfect and things we can and can't do, should do, shouldn't do, rules we're supposed to follow of the judge and trying to feel safe or trying to find the perfect way to do something so we don't run into future pains. But what we're really trying to avoid 
we're running away from past hurts. Because the future pains aren't there yet. We don't know what's actually going to happen if, say, we call the attorney or we take this action. We don't know what's going to happen, but our mind is projected it will be a future pain. When actually there's nothing there at all. Right? And we end up shying away or, or turning ourselves into contortions because of these ghosts that are really the pains in our past. So that's what fear is doing. It's alarming us and giving us a misdirection play and say, here's a problem, here's something you should, shouldn't do, have to be perfect, avoid rules to follow. Oh, don't talk to the attorney and something bad will happen, for instance. Put yourself in knots. When actually it's a misdirection because what she really needs to resolve, what's really painful, is a memory stored in her subconscious belief system about who has power and how old, even how old she is and how old she feels and whether she's safe and has agency or whether adults are going to screw things up for her. That's the real problem to be solved. But fear misdirects our attention to it's got something to do to, with today or this other person or my behavior or rule I'm not following or should follow. So that's part of the fear distortion mechanism about how we see the world or misdirection, where our attention goes when it should be back into, okay, let's clean up our past wounds, our past beliefs. 